So the theme being living in God's will, I uh, I was thinking about this when we had first mentioned the theme. I I went to a church when I was uh, 12 years old. I was all excited about getting into the teen Sunday school class. Um, and as I see with our own um, fellowship here, the kids are always excited when they get to get into the teen class because now you're you're grown up, you know. Um, and I was it was, I believe it was the first Sunday. So we had like uh, regular church and the message and then junior church for the teenagers. And there was a message there. And the, the guy was, I think it was a youth pastor. He was um, just pounding on the pulpit about, you have to know God's will right now. And I was 12 years old and I was kind of shaking. I was like, Oh no, I don't know God's will. And um, he was really emphasizing you, you would have had to have been like, you know, you're going to grow up and you have to be a missionary. And, you know, you're going to have to go into the the jungles of the Congo or something. And, or you're going to have to be an evangelist and you're going to have to spend your life on the road, stirring people's hearts and, you know, preaching week long um, evangelism messages and such, or you have to be a pastor and you're going to lead a group of thousands. And, you know, this is what I'm hearing when I'm 12 years old. So I'm trying to figure this out and my life just, Uh, was a senior in high school, uh, you know, I graduated and it's like, okay, I'm going to go to Bible college now. And so it just made sense that that was God's will for my life because I I said, well, I have to be a missionary evangelist, pastor, something of, you know, something pretty grand, but nobody ever told me um, living in God's will, really any, anything outside of that. It was always something kind of grand and big that you were going to do for God, but never the the little stuff. Um, and so that's a little bit of what I want to talk about today is uh, an uncompromising life that leads to God's will. Uh, what does the Christian life look like uh, when it when it comes to certain certain things that we face in life? What does that look like not compromising? Um, and where I want to start, and I think it's sometimes overlooked, um, and we think we think it's not that big of a deal. Uh, but I want to start with this matter of receiving honor from people. It doesn't seem like it's a big deal because, um, you know, people give you credit for something good that you do. Um, and, you know, it's just like, oh, yeah, you know, that's what you, that's what happens. You do something good. People give you credit and you get some some glory, some honor from it. Uh, but I want to look at a few examples in the scriptures. Uh, when I think of a person who just didn't compromise and they didn't have the Holy Spirit. I'm just, I'm just curious. I'm just going to ask you guys who in the old Testament do you think of where you just said this person lived a complete uncompromising life. I'm just curious what you, the first person would be. I heard, I heard Daniel. Someone said Daniel, the first one I heard that's, and that's who I thought. And you're right. There were other examples as well. Um, turn to Daniel chapter five. I want to show you this. If you'd consider how old um, Daniel was at this point in Daniel chapter five, um, you know, he had been taken away into Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had died at some point, and now Belshazzar, some years later, uh, was the king. And Daniel interprets this dream. Um, and the king is, you know, is really going to really heap a, a reward on the person who uh, can interpret this. And so Daniel does that, and he says, um. Uh, pick up in verse uh, 16, he says, uh, Belshazzar says, but I personally have heard about you that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you are able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. And this is Daniel's response in verse 17. He says, then Daniel answered and said before the king, Keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. So Daniel had no interest. I mean, if, if you think about like a world power, like the president coming to you and saying, hey, if you just do this one thing for me, I'm going to make you vice president or, or something. I mean, a huge, huge, huge honor. Um, and Daniel said he had no interest in any of it. Um, but, you know, when we talk about not compromising, this is chapter five, but where does it really, where does it begin with Daniel where he 
begins to not compromise. I mean, I know it probably started before, but what we read in the scriptures, what does it begin with? Does anyone know? He said it's hard not to defile himself. Began with food, right? Yeah. Not to defile himself with food. Something so small like food is what it started with. Um, and then we see years later, however many years, 40, 50 years later, whatever this is, he rejects any sort of honor and gifts from anyone. Um, consider Abraham as well, right? In Genesis 14, if you're familiar with the story early on there, um, when the king of Sodom, you know, there is that battle and the king of Sodom came to Abraham, um, verse 21, he says, Genesis 14, 21, he says, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. In verse 22, Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours. For fear you would say I have made Abram rich. Um, Abra Abraham, even, you know, well before Daniel, these are people without the Holy Spirit. They did not receive honor. This is not something that these men were looking for. Uh, and if you go even earlier, consider Noah. You know, if you read the entire um, Old Testament, you don't ever learn that Noah was a preacher. You actually don't know that until Peter mentions that that he was a preacher of righteousness. Uh, and you consider for, you know, 100 years, what, 120 years, he has this message, and he's building this boat, and he's a preacher. He's He was a shipbuilder as well, but he was also a preacher. Um and he could and he could have compromised his message, right? He could have he could have certainly, I think, had more than seven converts in 120 years. It's not really successful in in the standards of a you know a normal church. They don't if you if you said you had seven converts in 120 years, that's not exactly high numbers there for a church. But he didn't um, you know he didn't compromise his message. I think of another person too uh, in in the Old Testament, one of the great prophets, Elisha. Uh, in Second Kings chapter five, if you remember that story with Naaman, we'll turn there real quick. I'm just showing you a few different stories that we have some examples. Second um, Kings chapter five, after Naaman was healed, he said, uh, "We'll pick." Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, so please take a present from your servant now. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will take nothing. And look what he says after this. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. I find that interesting that, um, you know, here is this great general commander, and he, you know, Elisha really helped him, and he urges him. He's like, please take this gift. It's it's kind of like um, when you go to a restaurant and you both are willing to pay. And it's like, no, no, you pay or I'll pay. Put your credit card away. And then the other person says, no, no, no I'll pay. I insist. I insist. <laughs> but Elisha said, I won't take anything. He wouldn't take any honor uh, or any gifts or anything. Uh, you move to the New Testament even and you see Paul in Philippians chapter four. He's another example as well. There's all sorts of examples more than what I can show you this. As uh, to the church, he says, you yourselves also know Philippians that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. Uh, for even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. We see here that, Paul didn't receive gifts from anyone else. This one church he did, this was the only uh, church I believe we read of where he had received something. But Paul, I mean, you figure, you know, I, I grew up watching preachers and evangelists and missionaries, and, you know, they come into town and it's like you want to shower them with praise and you want to shower them with gifts. And, you know, it, it's the man of God coming to town. But Paul, I mean, if anyone should have received gifts and, and honor from people, it should have been Paul, and even he himself didn't. But I want to look at the last person here. 
what was Jesus's attitude towards receiving honor? Um, I find this interesting what Jesus said. If you turn to John chapter five, the best example, of course, is Jesus. And you see what his, what his uh, understanding was, how, what he thought of receiving honor. He says, verse 41, he just simply says, I do not receive glory from men. Um, a lot of other versions say honor. The Living Bible actually goes says a little bit different. It says, your approval or disapproval means nothing to me. He lived that much before the Lord that it, it literally meant nothing. Seeking anyone's approval or disapproval, receiving any honor from men, getting to that point to where it absolutely makes no difference whether or not anything good you ever do is recognized. Anyone gives you credit. There's no approval you're looking for no disapproval. You're not the only person that you're seeking to please is the Lord. And that's, that's where, that's where Jesus was. Of course, that's how he was able to live the life he did because he just sought to please the father. Um, and uh, if you continue down to verse 44, he says, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? I like that question. He says, how, how, do you, how can you even believe when what you're doing is seeking honor from each other? So even here this week while we're here, um, you know, you, you want to have a real spiritual conversation with someone and you want to impress them. And it's that receiving honor because people will think, oh, this is a spiritual brother. This is a spiritual sister. Um and it's and it's a it's a serious crime, really, that what verse 44 is saying, because he's saying, how can you even believe like you think you believe? And he says that actually a few verses up, search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Uh, but they, you know, they testify about me. And then he goes into this, um, you know, this discussion about receiving glory from people. Uh, I don't think. Uh, I mean, we know Abraham, Elisha, the people that I had mentioned, Noah, they would not have been the men of God that they were if they had received the honor from people. Uh, so I think we we take that, not that we take it light, but uh, receiving honor. And so God's will, as we talk about God's will, that will never lead to pursuing honor from men. That will never lead to us uh, pursuing that and and seeking that out. Um, now where else could we look for and something that we should never compromise in? And we were actually somewhat talking about it in the last session, even though I don't think we actually use this word, but I think one area that I found is critical that we can never compromise in is conscience. Um, mm -hmm. that, that area is so important. I'll tell you, we, uh, I was going through this matter of the conscience with, I teach the, uh, the teen Sunday school class at RLCF along with Brother Olu. And we were going through the book, uh, The Real Truth. I know one person sitting here remembers going through that. And um, it's kind of funny when one of the early chapters is on conscience. And we read a line uh, early on in that chapter, and it said, one of the greatest gifts of God is uh, from, from God to man is the conscience. And so we're reading on and we're discussing it. And then a few paragraphs later, it says, the greatest gift from God is, uh, from God to man is the conscience. And I think someone here probably remembers this conversation. And someone in the class, one of the teens said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I said, what's the matter? <laughs> you know, uh, we, what, the greatest gift from God is the conscience. And they said, um, they said, but look what it says a few paragraphs up. It says, one of the greatest gifts of God is the, so is it one of the greatest or is it the greatest? And I said, oh, that's simple. When <laughs> I said, when Brother Zach was writing this, he he believed it to be one of the greatest. And then God gave him revelation just a few paragraphs later, and he realized it was the greatest. <laughs> um, but th that is something, you know, that is something. And I, I'm glad the teens paid attention and caught that <laughs> because that stuck in their minds just how important the conscience is. Uh and, you know, nobody talks about conscience the way Paul does. You don't. Apostle Paul, 
Um, and, you know, I, I believe that correlates why Paul had such a good ministry. He talked about it. He, he was practicing the things that he was saying, uh, turn to first Timothy chapter one, you know, if there's certain things that are said in scripture and you could almost just kind of breeze over them and say, Oh yeah, that's not good. Um, but look at what he says here in First Timothy chapter 1. I think of the warning that he gives. You're probably familiar with this, um, this part at the end. Mm -hmm. He talks about a couple of people here. He, he's give, giving this command to Timothy. Uh, he says, verse 19, Keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. And then he names these two guys. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. I mean, it was just a matter of, you know, con concerning their, their conscience. That's all it was. That's all it was. It wasn't, he didn't go into anything else. I mean, we don't know much more than that, but we see where it started with the matter of just having a good conscience. And something along the way with these two guys they says they rejected it. So whatever was kind of giving them, you know, uh, we've probably, if we've heard brother Zach talk about the conscience, um, we've heard the illustration of it, like pain. And I think of, I think of, um, I think of when I tell my kids to go out there and pull weeds. And sometimes, you know, those weeds have those like little thorns and stuff and you pull it and it gives you that pain. But I always tell them get gloves when they don't get gloves. And they go out there and they pull weeds. They it tend to get those little, you know, prickly thorns and, and what have what have you in their hands. And it's a reminder, hey, you got to get gloves. And so I, I think that's how I understand um, the illustration of pain with my kids. Uh, that's the conscience right there. It's 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 like pain. It's telling us something is wrong, and you can keep rejecting it, which is what these guys did. And you know, if you uh, shipwreck your faith i mean that it, it leads you to hell i mean that's that's the ultimate end of not being careful in that matter of our of of our conscience it's a it's a very serious thing um look in acts chapter 23 i think i, I love that uh luke records this situation with paul uh paul was brought before the, con the the council here in verse one, it says, brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. And then the high priest Ananias, verse two, commands uh, those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. <clears throat> then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law, order me to be struck? But the bystander said, do you revile God's priest? Now look over in Acts chapter 24, just one chapter later. Uh, remember, remember this story that we have here. Uh, lost my place here. Sorry. Um, Peace in the verse. Sorry about that. Is it 16? Yes, thank you very much. I know. Um, he says he says this in verse sixteen. He says, "In view of this, this is Paul speaking. I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience before God and before men." Okay, now remember what we just saw. How could he say in the next chapter? He just spoke out against the high priest. How could he say, "I always keep, uh, I always do my best, I always try." <clears throat> to keep a blameless conscience before God and before men. We'll go back to Acts ch chapter 23, and let's read the rest of the story. So they said, do you revile God's high priest? And this is where Paul immediately, and he's just asked this question, he was just slapped on the mouth, and Paul says, I was not aware, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you should not speak evil of a ruler of your people. And so he immediately set the matter right, as we hear so often, set the matter right. And his conscience told him, 
you have to make things right right now. And the high priest wasn't right for doing it, but Paul, you know, the Lord, I believe the, the Holy Spirit gave him that verse that you should not speak evil of a ruler of your people. And immediately Paul had apologized. And that was his conscience. That was why he could say just a chapter later, I do my best to, um, to maintain that good conscience. So again, I think that, you know, this, you look at, um, you look in the old Testament, look at David. I, I think about him. I think this might've been mentioned today. Um, second Samuel, go to second Samuel chapter 24. Someone might've made mention of this earlier, I think. Um, you know, it's near the end of David's life. And there's this situation where David was lifted up in pride and Satan had uh, kind of encouraged him to do something very proud to number the people. Verse 10. Again, these are people in the Old Testament. They didn't have the Holy Spirit to help them along. He says, now David's heart troubled him after he had numbered the people. And I, I think there might be another version. I, I don't, I'm not sure. I think another version actually says his conscience troubled him. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have acted very foolishly. Again, David, what was he known for? He was known for being a man after God's own heart, right? Um, and he... He didn't have the Holy Spirit, but yet he he knew when he had sinned, his conscience told him, hey, this wasn't right what you did. And he's, he doesn't just say, I've sinned. He says, I've greatly sinned. This is terrible what I did. Because what, what was he doing in that? He wasn't necessarily receiving honor from people, but what he was doing was he was taking the glory to himself, the great kingdom he had built, not giving the recognition to God. And he realizes how bad that was, stealing God's glory and taking it for himself. So the, again, there's more examples in this, but I, I find first what I had mentioned, honor, never compromising and receiving honor from men. Um, now uh, we talked about the conscience and keeping a clear conscience and uh, there, you, you can't proceed in doing the will of God if you don't have a clear conscience. And uh, we know, especially when it comes to having a, um, an issue with someone or there's a grievance with someone that can really meddle with your conscience. It really muddies, muddies up your thinking. Uh, and forgiveness is the only way to clean the, to clean our conscience. So it's, you know, it's, it's a serious thing that you can't just, it, again, we talked about it a little bit in the last session concerning backsliding. A lot of that is, is, is the conscience and someone searing their conscience and not wanting to obey it. That's why it's, again, we, that story I gave at the beginning in that book, the real truth we talked about, it's the greatest gift of God from mankind. That's how important it is. Uh, could, because without it, how would we be convicted of sin if, if, if God didn't give us a conscience? So I would say the next thing, Jesus said, in Matthew chapter 11, we've heard it so many times, and it's good that we hear it so many more times, but he said, learn of me for I'm meek and lowly in heart. And it's humility. That's one area we cannot compromise in. Um, you don't get anywhere without humility. And I've, I've come to realize the kingdom of God really is meant, it's made for those who continually decrease. That really is, those are the people that belong in God's kingdom, the ones that see that they have to continually decrease. Look at John chapter 3. You're probably familiar with this passage with, um, you know, the, the people came to John and were saying, hey, you know, Jesus is basically having a greater ministry than you. I see them kind of trying to stir him up and trying to, you know, battle each other and be jealous of each other. And he just simply says this verse, he says, John 3 30, he says, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's it. That's what John knew right there. He, he knew Jesus had to increase and he must decrease. Um, 
I, I love this illustration in the Old Testament in Ecclesiastes. I don't know if you've seen this little illustration. If you go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I like how the, I'm not reading from the Living Bible, but I like how the Living Bible uh, turns this little story, it phrases it well. But I'll, I'll read from the NASB here. Um, I love the humility of this tale that is told in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Uh, he says in verse 13, he says, Also this I came to see as wisdom under the sun, and, and it impressed me. Verse 14, there was a small city with few men in, in it, and a great king came to it, surrounded it, and constructed large siege works against it. And I love this next verse. This next verse speaks so much of humility. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he delivered the city by his wisdom, yet no one remembered that poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength, but the wisdom of the poor man is despised, and his words are not heeded. The words of the wise heard in quietness are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Uh, you know, this is something Solomon had written, and um, this great king comes, and of course the king would think, okay, I'm, I'm attacking a little city. We're going to take it, no problem. And the city is preparing for war and, you know, you have all the warriors, you have everyone and they're all getting ready for battle. And then somewhere in the corner, somewhere is this, this poor guy, like nobody gives him any thought at all, but he's wise. And nobody even realizes that it's this one guy in the corner um, with his wisdom, he ends up saving the city from this great host that comes against it. And it goes on to say, Again, no one remembered him. And then the next verse, it says, the wisdom of the poor man is despised and his words are not heeded. But that verse also starts off by off by saying wisdom is better than strength. There, I see great humility there. The guy, the guy, I don't think the guy said, hey, it was me who saved everyone. What about me? I, I deserve the recognition. Just completely humble. He probably went back to his corner being a poor man. Nobody thought about him. I love that tale of humility. I think it's a, a one of the best illustrations in the Old Testament that we see from from Solomon, you know, who had, you know, he learned a lot in Ecclesiastes, what you read of, and he says this impressed him, seeing seeing how wisdom works, and then he gives that illustration. Um, and I think there's something else also neat when you go to the New Testament. I'm going to go back to Paul, First Timothy. If you go back there to chapter one. I love what he says here um, in chapter one. He's, I kind of picture him speaking to Timothy this way in uh, verse 15. He says, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Another version, King James says, of whom I am chief. He's the chief sinner. But I kind of picture him saying, he says, Timothy, I'm going to let you in on a secret. You know the first part, the first part being that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. You know that part, but what you don't realize, and this is the secret, he's saying, I'm the worst of them all. And that's incredible humility. After everything, by the time First Timothy had been written, all that Paul had done, and yet he can make a statement like that. And, you know, it wasn't just like, um, you know... It, it wasn't uh he wasn't acting and saying oh no no i'm i'm not a good guy it wasn't like that you know some people do he was saying i'm i'm the worst of the worst that is out there like how could that that doesn't that doesn't register how could paul be the worst sinner that doesn't make any sense he did all of these great things he received all these revelations all this glory all this um well not glory but you know the the revelations i'm thinking of in second corinthians chapter 12 the Lord is with him, and he's got all these prophets, all of these things with Paul. And yet, as he's getting closer to the end of his life, 
He says, I'm the worst of the worst. That's the humility right there that we have to maintain. Um, and really, I, I think if you were to talk about all the secrets to Paul's life, if you said, why was Paul used so much? I mean, this is it right here, because he believed that. He believed he was the worst out there. And he was so grateful that Jesus came to save, to save him. He knew Jesus came into the world to save sinners, but he was especially grateful because of how exceedingly great his sin was. Um, so yeah, I, I, again, these these are three things now: receiving, not receiving honor from men, um, and then secondly is our conscience, keeping that clean. I mentioned humility. Next, I'll mention honesty. Um, and again, this is another part of the will of God in our lives, which leads us to a more honest life. Uh, think of I, th I think of this when I was um, when I was first introduced to Brother Zach. So I was still in the Baptist church at the time, and I had rejected um, what I had heard from Brother Zach, but I, I had not heard much at that point. And I remember I went to this one church. I think I've sh I might have shared this story before, but I went to this one church where the guy, it was someone I was really wanting to listen to, someone I had a lot of respect for in the Baptist. And he got up there and he said, the title of my message today is Jesus. That was it, Jesus. And I thought, oh, hey, you know, if, you've, if, if you're going to have just one message and just one title and just one word to the message, what could possibly be a better message than just saying Jesus? You know, that's that's it. And so he kind of he kind of stood there behind the pulpit. And I was thinking, OK, yeah, this is going to be good. We're going to hear about Jesus. And mind you, I just kind of heard some things from Brother Zach and I kind of threw them off. I wasn't listening to my conscience then. Um and, but it didn't end there. About 10 seconds later, he says, Jesus, the Baptist. That's what he said. That's what he said. He said, the message was Jesus, the Baptist. And so, uh, so then my, my conscience started going again after that. And he went through, I don't know, 30, 40 verses proving how Jesus was a Baptist. Mostly because he was baptized by John the Baptist, but... <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, though, in sharing that story is about honesty that I had to face in my life back then. I'm speaking from personal experience that I just had to be honest and say, you know, I don't think something is quite right about this. It felt like we were um, molding a, a God into our own image, right? Just we we believe this and we know that Jesus is out there, but we know that we're going to make Jesus like this. We're not going to let the scriptures speak. It looks like we're letting the scriptures speak, but we're not going to let them speak. And I remember walking away and I thought, you know, that's actually one of the best things that could have happened, <laughs> listening to that message, because something registered and said something was wrong. And I was just honest about it because I, I was struggling between a couple of things I had heard from Brother Zach, even though I had disagreed with it at the time. But something was inside of me saying, Something's not right. Go back to David. Remember him and um, the sin that he had committed. You know, you wonder how the writers, Samuel Kings, you know, how they chronicles, they could say that David was a man after God's own heart. Turn to Second Samuel chapter 12. You know, David had a, an incredible sin here that he had committed with Bathsheba. You know that story, uh, the adultery with Bathsheba. And then he went on to try to make it look like Uriah was going to be the father of the child. And then he had Uriah killed. And you say, how in the world could this, he's a murderer. I mean, you realize that the man after God's own heart in the Old Testament is a adulterous murderer, uh, completely, you know, the Romans says, for all have come short of the glory of God. I mean, this is, you typically think of murderers and adulterers coming short of the glory of God, and this is David. But that's not what made him a man after God's own heart, obviously, not that. But look what he says when Nathan, when Nathan confronts him, and he gives him this story about, you know, the basically another guy bullying another guy with his lambs. He says, what would you do? And David says what he would do and make restitution, all this. And then Nathan says to David, verse 7, he says, 
you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, it is I who anointed you king over, over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. So the Lord's reminding him through Nathan what he's done for him. And he says, you're the man. And he says, um, he says, verse 12, about the evil that he's going to, verse 11, the evil that's going to rise up from his own household and all these terrible things that are going to happen. Verse 12, indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. Okay, now, typically when someone is found out like that, they start justifying themselves, right? They start saying, yeah, but you don't understand. Bathsheba shouldn't have been there. And Uriah, he should have listened to me when I told him I was his king. After all, he should have listened to me and he didn't listen. And But what did David do? Was, again, I, we just talked about what David did with the numbering of the people. Verse 13, he just says, I've sinned against the Lord. That was it. And Nathan said to David, what, what's his, because he said, I really believe this because he said that. The next thing Nathan said to David, verse 13 at the end, the Lord has also taken away your sin. You shall not die. I think the only reason is because David said, I've sinned against the Lord. That was it. There was nothing else. And that's the, the honesty that God is looking uh, for from us. It's it's similar to the conscience, right, that we just talked about. It's similar to that, uh, where we just need to be honest. Uh, we've heard different illustrations how the foundation of the Christian life is built on honesty. And it's true. If you don't have that, you can't get to humility. You can't get to other virtues, the fruit of the Spirit, without honesty. I think of probably one of the greatest examples we find in the book of Luke. I know you've all heard of this man, Luke chapter 23. As Jesus is dying on the cross, you know, if you read the scriptures carefully, you actually see, we always think of the thief on the cross and how he, you know, he's going to see Jesus in paradise. But you know, the start of that story we read it in Luke. Um, the start of that story is that both criminals are actually mocking him. It says, it doesn't say that in Luke. It says it in Matthew or Mark, one of those two. It says that, that they were both mocking him. And then something about Jesus silently sitting there, I believe something about that caused that thief to say, wait a minute, something's all wrong here. And it, his conscience at the last, last, last second of his life, the last moments of his life got to him and he became honest with himself. And the one criminal, as he's, it says, verse 39, he's hurling abuse at Jesus. Save yourself, save us. Are you not the Christ? The other one rebukes him. It's like, what right did that guy have to rebuke him? He was a criminal too. They were both criminals. He says, do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly. And that is like, this is why this guy is in paradise. We're reading it right now. For we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, you know, he says this after he rebukes him. He looks at Jesus and he says, remember me when you come in your kingdom. This is, this is what we just read. This is why he is in paradise. He's, he's with the Lord right now because he said, I'm suffering justly. Everything I deserve. He didn't make. He did. There's no. There's no excuse at all. And one of the most. I. I would say one of the most profound things that the Lord has hit me with in the last. Last twenty years, I've heard Brother Zach say this a few times, and it's one of the things that has stuck with me, probably more than anything. The story with, uh, the thief on the cross, when Brother Zach has said the kingdom of God is made for those who blame themselves. That has stuck with me more than almost anything I could think of in the last 20 years. The kingdom of God is made for those who blame themselves. I love that. And again, it, it goes along with what we've been talking about with honesty, which le leads me to my last point in the last area that we just simply cannot compromise in. Uh, we've talked about receiving honor from people. That's not something we can compromise in. Do not receive honor from people. We've talked about desiring a clean conscience. We've talked about continually decreasing through humility. We've talked about leading 
a more honest life. And now finally, the last thing that I would say that we can never, ever, ever compromise in, we must love one another. It has to be something that we never, ever, ever compromise in. It is something, you know, I just, I had just mentioned how that phrase, the kingdom of God is made for those who blame themselves. I just mentioned how that hit me. I think when you read John's five books that he writes, you see it especially, I think probably more in first John, I think something in that night before the crucifixion, I think something hit John so hard that it's just something that just stuck with him. You see it in his writings later on. Uh, turn to Second John, book of Second John. Because you see what he says, you know, these books, First John, Second John, Third John, Revelation, these were the last books of the Bible. And this is God in heaven inspiring these words. These are some of the absolute last words that will ever be written in the Bible. There's no more words that are ever going to be added. And John has this message that he says, we read in verse five. Now, I ask you, lady, and I like how the King James says, I beseech you, I'm urging you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is one of the final messages that is being written to the church. I, I kind of think of it like when I'm at work or something and I have emails and I'm writing emails, but then there comes something along that's really important. And then, you know, you could hit that box that says like uh, no priority or low priority, high priority. I kind of picture this as like, you keep hitting high priority. This is such an important message. When the email goes out, I need you to understand this is more important. And he just says, this is what I'm urging you. You have to love one another. It's the commandment. He says that we have I've had from the beginning, right from the beginning, this is the commandment that we have. And he realizes right at the end of his commandment that he has to tell people, love one another. And go back up maybe a page or two in your in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. I'm going to jump around a few different places just to show you what I mean here about the impact. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, he says, Beloved, let us love one another. Why should we love one another? He says it right here, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know, does not know God. Why? Because God is love. So John is continuously saying, and he says it over and over again. I'll show you a few more. You have to love one another. I have to love one another. Why does he keep saying that? Why does he keep saying you have to love one another? It's because you have to love one another. That's why. First John chapter 3, verse 11. Like what he says again. It's, it's like saying something in a message. Think of an email when you write an email. And you're getting a point across. But then you go later on in the email and you get the same point across. And then you keep going in the email and you get the same point across. It's like, well, why do you keep saying the same thing? Because it's that important. First John 3, 11. This is the message which you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Um, and again, later on, verse, verse 23, same chapter. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. When did he command us to do that? Well, in this case with John, he, he personally commanded him in person. Remember, in John, you turn to John 13, In John 13, Jesus is about to be handed over. He's speaking with his disciples, and he says, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you. Here it is, that you love one another. How is that a new commandment? <laughs> and then 60 years later or so, John is still saying the same thing. He says, I'm going to give you a new commandment. He's just repeating what Jesus told him. I'm going to give you a new commandment. But then he goes on to say even more, though, not just that you love one another, even as I have loved you. I mean, think of the love that Jesus had for those men that night. He says, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. 
He says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is how the world's going to know that we are the disciples of Christ. If you really want to let the world know in the workplace, if you really want to let the world know when they when they see your life, it's the love you have for one, one, one another. John 15, again, look what Jesus does again. Keep in mind, he just said in verse or in chapter 13, you have to love one another. Look at verse uh, chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. And then he goes on to say, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. And verse 14, remember why he said a commandment I give you later on. Remember in 1 John, 2 John, I have these commands for you. Verse, 15, verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. You see, Jesus, right, right there, both the last message Jesus had for his disciples and the last message that God had written for the scriptures is this final command, love one another. It could have been a lot of things that he could have said. We just go down the list of all the things God could have closed the scriptures with. But he says, this is what I have for you, that you love one another. Look at one more in First Peter. Go to First Peter chapter 1. Remember, Peter also would have been with Christ. He doesn't use the same words as John, but First Peter chapter 1, verse 22, he says, Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls. You're born again. You're part of his kingdom. He says, for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. So our love is to be a fervent love one for another. Like, well, well, there are so many verses, obviously. I'm just picking out a few. There's so many that we could go to, and and you all may be thinking of some that I'm not going to even mention, but turn to Galatians chapter 5. And this is, you know, I think of one of the biggest things that sometimes we commonly do um, at River of Life at in, in any church is the service that we give. Uh, I'm not talking about the main service, but how we serve in the church. And, you know, this person helps with the kids and this person helps with the cleaning and this person helps with the organizational, whatever it is. But even when we serve, look what he says here. Paul says, Galatians 5, 13, For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. And this is interesting that he kind of is talking about freedom. And then the very last thing he ends with is, But through love, serve one another. So this love that we, we are to have, our service is done out of love. So I think of that being important as we as we serve one another um, in our local fellowships, how should it be done? Through love. And then finally, I'll turn to one last thing here as, as our time is almost over here. Uh, First Thessalonians, you go to chapter three. I love what he writes to the Thessalonian church here, what he says. Verse 11, he says, Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you. You know, the example Paul had to the Thessalonian church, he said, this example that we've done, this act of love that we've done for you, take this and let the Lord increase it. Let it abound more. And I love you. Now, we, and we've been hearing love for one another. But then he says, not just for one another, though, but for all people. Our love that we have should be for all people. The love of God that constrains us, right, that we read of in Romans. It's to all people. And we see that through the life of Christ so perfectly, his love for the people. So these are the things that the Lord was really impressing on on me to speak about as we were talking about living living in the will of God 
things that I find that we just, at least uh, I've found to be some of the most important things that you just can't compromise in. Watch out for receiving honor from people. Don't don't look for that. Don't pursue that. Always keep a clear conscience. Continually decrease through humility. Seek to live a more honest life. And then lastly, we must always love one another. May that be true. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you.